Having discussed GANs and VAEs so far, let's now talk about methods that have attempted to combine GANs and VAEs in a single framework. Before we go there, let's try to reco recollect the questions that we left behind last lecture. One of the questions was, why does the encoder of a VAE map to a vector of means and a vector of standard deviations? Why does it not map to a vector of means and an entire covariance matrix? Hope you had a chance to think about it. In this case, by design, we are explicitly learning a set of independent Gaussians. That's the reason you only need standard deviations per each dimension of the Gaussian. And we are not going to go with learning an entire covariance matrix. Technically speaking, it is possible to also learn a complete covariance matrix, but that does complicate how a VAE learns. Importantly, this approach works and it's easy to learn, relatively speaking, when compared to a complete covariance matrix. And that's the reason we went ahead with that choice. What about the decoder? If we assumed a mean squared error for the reconstruction loss, if you recall, VAE had two terms in its objective function, a reconstruction loss, which is about maximizing uh, one of a conditional probability, and then a KL divergence term. If we used mean square error for the reconstruction loss, what would be the covariance of P of X given Z, assuming it's a Gaussian? If you thought carefully about this, if this, this particular case of assuming a mean square error would be equivalent to modeling P of X given Z as a Gaussian with identity covariance. In which case, you only need to learn the means. The standard deviations are given to be one. So the decoder output would be the mean alone and the identity covariance would be a given. So in this case, the reconstruction loss would become minus log of P XI given say TI or ZI. Uh, where t is say each dimension, would if you expand the Gaussian formula in this particular case, you would notice that because you have an identity matrix as the covariance matrix, minimizing this negative log likelihood term simplifies to minimizing the mean square error which is inside. This first term here would become a constant. It does not depend for the minimization term. Minus log an exponential are inverse operations and you will be left only with this mean square error term. So using mean square for the reconstruction loss in a VAE is equivalent to assuming that your distribution P theta of X given Z is a multivariate Gaussian but with an identity covariance matrix. Let's try to look at the positives and negatives of VAEs and GANs before we discuss methods that combine them. VAEs, the biggest positive is they learn a very strong inference mechanism or machine. By mapping data to a latent space with the distribution of choice with a fast effective inference step, the negative, however, is because of the use of KL divergence, VAs do have a tendency to distribute the probability mass diffusely over the data space, may not cover the entire space, which is one reason to, for VAEs to result in blurry or row quality image samples. The other reason is by sampling from a distribution, there is always an averaging effect and that could also result in blurry generations rather than having sharp image generations from the latent space of a VAE. On the other hand, GANs, they don't have an inference step 
you don't try to learn a latent from data. Recall that for GANs, you just give a Gaussian vector as input without worrying about whether that's the real latent manifold which captures the data distribution. And then you learn a generator model that produces high quality samples at a good sampling speed. That's the objective of GAN. The negative is that GANs lack that inference mechanism which could prevent from reasoning about data at an abstract level. For example, you cannot look at the latent variables and be able to attach semantics to each latent variable. For example, you may not be able to say that the first latent variable corresponds to identity, second latent variable corresponds to expression, pose, so on and so forth. It's difficult to do with a GAN, whereas with a VAE, that procedure is implicit in its design. Now, the question that we try to ask is, can we try to combine a VAE and a GAN to be able to get high quality samples as well as have an effective inference network to be able to reason at the level of latent variables. So you see here that for a variational autoencoder, at training time, you have an encoder, you learn a latent space, which then feeds into a decoder. And at test time, you sample from that latent space and pass to a decoder. A GAN has a generator, which competes with the discriminator. And at test time, you provide random noise to the generator and the generator can generate images. So what we're going to see now is whether these two pipelines can be combined in some ways. To do that, let's first discuss a few limitations of VAEs in more detail. Recall the VAE objective, which is given by the conditional distribution, the log likelihood, and a KL divergence term that matches the approximate posterior with the prior. Now, if you look at these terms, this can be the first term here can be replaced by a reconstruction loss. And the second you can view as a certain kind of a prior loss where the first term is implemented, perhaps through a mean square error. And the second term is implemented using the same KL divergence. If you look at mean square error as a reconstruction loss, mean square error is inherently limited by its capabilities. Why is this so? Mean square error is an L2 distance between two images pixel wise. And the moment you do that, you're assuming that the reconstruction fidelity or the signal fidelity in, the, in our case, the signal is the generated 2D image is independent of spatial or any temporal relationships across the pixels, which is clearly not true for images. Images do have a lot of local spatial correlation. The element wise metric of trying to find a mean square error between every pixel in the same location does not model human perception of image fidelity and quality. We'll see an example soon. And that could also lower the image quality in VAs. And finally, the same pixel based loss metric mean square error does not respect semantic preserving transforms. So you could have two images which have the same object, but in one image it's rotated from the other. Semantically, this is still the same image, but pixel wise, this could result in a huge mean square error. A very nice study in this work known as mean square error, love it or leave it, shows a few tangible examples. Here you see an image of Albert Einstein. So you have an image A here and you can see images B through I. And if you took these images and observed the ones from B to G, that's from here to here, these images in the first and second row. And if you compare them to A, you can clearly see that they have significant differences. You can see some images 
to be very sharp some images to have a blur a certain noise a significant blur so on and so forth but it happens that each of those images from b to g have almost the same mean square error from the first image a on the other hand if you consider those images from h to i they all look the same to the human eye but they all have very high la large mean square error values to the original image that talks about mean square error as a metric for capturing the goodness of reconstruction in addition to this vaes have a couple of other problems also by using the kl divergence to match the approximate posterior to the prior on the latent variables z inherently kl divergence focuses on encouraging q of z the approximate posterior in our case to pick the modes of p of z so if you had p of z to be a distribution something like this what q of z tries to do is try to ensure that it matches p in these points where there's a high density because that's what would give it a low kl divergence score between q and p and by doing that q may not really completely match the entire distribution of p that could leave spaces or holes in the in the learned latent space of z which may therefore result in failing to capture the data manifold it could also miss several local regions in the data space which could also affect generalization capability of generating examples out of a vae lastly even the prior considered in vaes could become a limitation remember that vaes require you to assume a certain functional form of a prior such as a unit gaussian and sometimes for different kinds of priors vaes may be difficult to optimize you may not get a close form solution in our case because we assumed the approximate posterior and the prior to be gaussian the kl divergence term became a closed form there was a closed form expression for a kl divergence between two gaussian distributions which turned out to be differentiable which allowed us to use it for training the vae that may not be true for other kinds of priors and this limits us to choices of priors that can be used in a vae how do you address these limitations of vaes that's what we're going to talk about by bringing in and integrating elements of gans in a vae to help improve its performance we'll talk about a couple of seminal methods in this context in this lecture and one of the first efforts here is known as an adversarial auto encoder the adversarial auto encoder is given by this illustration on the left so the top row here is a standard variational auto encoder as you can see x going to z a latent variable you sample from from that latent space and you have a decoder which gives you a reconstruction the bottom part of an adversarial auto encoder has a discriminator and the discriminator's job is to not look at images and say whether they're real or fake but to look at the latent space and see whether the latent space came from the real distribution the latents corresponding to the real distribution which you may have got from uh, some other place like a gan for instance and the latent code that comes uh, while learning the vae why do we do this this has a very important connotation a very important meaning here the goal here is to now make the vaes prior ma match the original prior of the data's distribution this is important now because no more are you asking the approximate posterior to match a unit gaussian but you're asking it to match a data prior that is known which would allow the vae to be more powerful in its functioning 
So this allows you to render a more continuous learned latent space that in turn allows to capture the data manifold well. And by through this process, we are converting the data distribution to prior distribution and the decoder learns a deep generator model that maps that imposed prior to a data distribution. So instead of using a KL divergence between the approximate posterior and a unit Gaussian, we now use an adversarial objective to match that approximate posterior to the prior of the data generating distribution. So if you looked at the original objective of VAE, we had two terms, the reconstruction term and the KL regularizer. Now in an adversarial autoencoder, the KL regularizer is replaced by an adversarial loss of a discriminator that's trying to classify the latent code as belonging to the VAE or belonging to the original data distribution. So in the reconstruction phase, you introduce a latent variable with a simple prior, you sample Z and pass it through a generator. And re remember that in a GAN, we said we need to introduce a mechanism to ensure PG is P data. And in the adversarial autoencoder, this is done by matching the aggregated posterior here, this one from the variational autoencoder to where an arbitrary prior using adversarial objective based training. That comes from your GANS discriminator objective. And by doing so, adversarial autoencoders give very strong performance. Here is an example uh, using a model for an adversarial autoencoder and comparing it against a variational autoencoder uh, on MNIST data set. And what you see on top here is where a prior based on a spherical 2D Gaussian is used and the bottom is where the prior is a mixture of 10 2D Gaussians. And you can see here from the top that the adversarial autoencoder learns a more continuous latent space whereas the VAE has a lot of discontinuities in that latent space. And if you look at the bottom image, the adversarial autoencoder learns a fairly smooth multimodal distribution, all those modes along those different directions, whereas the VAE still struggles even in that setting. This particular work for adversarial autoencoders also showed that you could also use more complex priors if you choose to. Here is an example of where a latent space of an adversarial autoencoder was trained on MNIST with the prior being a Swiss roll distribution as you see here. So you, you can now sample from this distribution by walking along the axis here, this particular case, the samples were generated by walking along the Swiss roll axis, passing it to the VAE's decoder and generating samples. And you can see here that you have a fair good amount of variety in the generation of samples in the MNIST dataset by walking along such a prior. So this entire idea of adversarial autoencoders replaces the KL divergence term in the objective of variational autoencoder with an adversarial learning term. When we say adversarial learning, we mean the loss corresponding to the discriminator calling an item fake or real. And the nice part of this approach is there is no functional form of a prior required. Whatever prior is provided is what Q tries to match. A second popular method tries to look at the objective of a VAE from the other perspective. So while adversarial autoencoders replaced the KL divergence term with an adversarial objective, VAE GANs try to replace the reconstruction loss with a different term. What do they replace it with? Instead of a pixel-wise mean square error, 
VAE GANs replace it as a feature-wise distance in the discriminator's representation space between outputs that come from a VAE and original data. This approach combines the advantage of GAN as a high-quality generator model and VAE as a method that can produce an encoding of data into a latent space and then further reasoning at the latent space level. So the loss formulation in this particular case is based on representations of the discriminator. Remember the discriminator is yet another neural network. So you can take a certain layer of the discriminator given by this sub L which denotes the Lth layer of the discriminator. Let's assume that the output of that discriminator's Lth layer is given by this Lx which are the feature representations that we're going to compare between a VAE's generated output and a real data input. So P dis L of X given Z is assumed to be a Gaussian distributions, Gaussian distribution given this way, where X tilde is an output of the decoder using, which is obtained using a VAE. So the first loss term is given by L reconstruction content, which is your first term of your VAE objective, which is given by for expectation or samples coming from the approximate posterior log P of dis L of X given Z, which is very close to the first term that we had in the VAE objective. The second term comes from a GAN based objective, which is L reconstruction style which is log of dis of x. So if the data comes from the real distribution, which is x, the GAN or the discriminator tries to maximize the log of dis of x and log of one minus dis of gen of z is also maximized. So z is a latent that comes from the VAE's latent space. And finally, you continue to have your prior loss which tries to match the approximate posterior to the P of Z. Recall that the main difference now is that this first term here is now based on the features of the discriminator. So the total loss is given by the addition of these three losses. So the overall training algorithm for the VAE GAN is given by you sample a mini batch of samples from your training data set. You get an encoding of Z using the encoder in a variational autoencoder. Then you have your prior loss, which tries to match the approximate posterior obtained through your encoder part of your VAE with P of Z. Then X hat is obtained through the decoder of the VAE when z is given as input, z is a latent variable. Now coming to the discriminator, as we already saw, we saw that one of the loss terms is minus expectation p of dis of x given z. There is one other component that VAE GAN adds while training, which improves performance, is it also lets the user sample from a unit normal prior which is given as zp and that is passed through a decoder to get the reconstruction xp and the GAN loss in addition to minimizing uh, the, the likelihood of x hat fooling the discriminator also tries to minimize the likelihood of xp fooling the discriminator. So that's the loss of the GAN and finally the encoder, decoder and discriminator are updated using the corresponding gradients that affect each of those outputs. So obviously each of those networks only use the losses that are relevant for that particular network. So if you observe carefully, you would notice here that the discriminator loss should not try to minimize the reconstruction content loss which is your first term here 
as that would collapse the discriminator to give a zero at all times. This is very similar to GANs where we talked about training the discriminator fully in the very beginning. And as we just mentioned, the VAE GAN model also allows using of samples XP which are obtained from a unit normal prior in addition to X tildes which are generated as output of the VAE. And finally, each of these recon content and recon style losses which are the first two losses here are weighted to be able to control a trade off between reconstruction uh, quality, reconstruction quality and fooling the discriminator. Here are some examples of results. You can see here that when you train a VA on face images, you see that while you get an overall sense of a face image, there is not complete clarity while the center of the image has a certain acceptable degree of a face. You can see this as you go away to the periphery, the clarity keeps dropping down as you keep going away from the center. And you see that the VAE GAN gives a fairly good performance of obtaining sharpness and clarity of the face images. While GANs also do a good job, GANs do suffer from some artifacts which miss global information. VAEs are excellent at retaining global information but miss fine-grained sharpness. GANs on the other hand do have local sharpness but at times miss global content and can sometimes place different parts in different locations. And VAE GANs bring the best of both worlds together to be able to generate globally relevant content at the same time keep each of the pixels and each of the local areas sharp in terms of perception. Another thing that you can do with these kinds of models which was shown with a VAE GAN is to do conditional generation. In this particular example, in VAE GANs, the authors concatenated the face attribute vector. So you could for example have these attributes such as white, fully visible forehead, mouth closed, male, curly hair, eyes open, pale skin, frowning, pointy nose, teeth not visible and no eyewear for instance. So this can be represented as an attribute vector. So you can put zeros and ones for different attributes for instance. And that's appended to the vector representation of input in the encoder, decoder and discriminator modules while training. And this trained model is used to generate faces which are conditioned on some held out test attributes. So at test time, a new face attribute vector which is held out, which was not used before, is concatenated to the input representation and now the model is able to generate faces that satisfy these requirements in the attributes. So all these images here are generations of a face conditioned on these attributes and you see that for most of them certain attributes such as fully visible forehead, white, male, so on and so forth are actually met to a reasonable extent uh, justifying this kind of an approach. Compared to a VAE, one can see that the VAE GAN gives significantly good results for such conditional generation experiments. Your homework for this lecture would be to go through this excellent a link on a wizard's guide to adversarial autoencoders part 1 and part 2 as well as a nice tutorial on VAE GANs and a nice video on YouTube on VAE GANs if you are interested. Do go through them. Mm -hmm.